But we're starting a new sermon series today. We've been, it's actually designed to follow on the heels of what we did in the last eight or so weeks. If you were with us during that and we had this look at uh, the pursuing God and how God pursues us and how he chases us down, how he, he pursues us. God does not stay hidden up in heaven, locked away. He doesn't sit up there hidden and just waiting for us to, to, to turn to him or, or for us to try and get his attention. He pursues us. He chases us down. And that's the, that's the story of the gospel. It's a story of God looking for you. He yearns for you. He desires you. He is so excited to, to have you as, in relationship. And this is what our great God, he does. And so we looked at that walking through the gospel of Luke. But you may not be aware that Luke wrote a second book called the book of Acts. Luke is the writer of most of the New Testament or the largest part of the New Testament. And he wrote uh, the book of Acts, which is a story of the early church and how it responded to the pursuing God, the God who pursues us, and how they, in turn, went out into the world to pursue others for Jesus, to tell people about Jesus. And so we're look, taking this up. This new series is called Witnesses, and that we're called to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus. If you think about it, and you can actually think of a face or a person in this, every one of us in this room, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe in, in what the scriptures say about him, you believe it, you are following him because someone told you about him. Someone. It might be, in all likelihood, a lot of people told you about him. But there was someone who started the whole thing. <clears throat> it could be parents, it could be grandparents, aunts or uncles, friends. But somebody told you about Jesus. For me, it was when I was in high school, 1975, at a youth camp, Young Life camp. And the speaker told me and about 499 of my best friends, this is who Jesus is. And then it changed my life. And that was in the summer, 1975. And that fall, that, that winter, December, actually, the, there was a Young Life gathering. And there they, they talked to us again, a different man, talked about what it means to follow Jesus and shape your life around his and it was these people, they told me about him and enlarged my understanding. They brought me to faith. They opened my eyes and my understanding of who Jesus was. And through the years, through all the years, there have been countless people who have told me about Jesus in different ways and enlarged my understanding of him, enlarged my growth in him. Every one of you, every one of us in this room, we're here because someone, somewhere back in our past, pointed to Jesus. They described him to us. They told us who he is, what he does, why he matters, why, why you can trust him. It might have been with a lot of words. It might have been with less words. It might have been just mostly with their life, their example. But in any case, all of us were here. We're in faith because someone or someones pointed to Jesus. And that's what this series is about, is looking at the early churches when they have been aware, made aware that Jesus is alive, that he's incredible, he's good, he is God in the flesh, come to help us, save us. It gave them a message that they wanted to share. It was something that just had to be shared. Have you ever had something that's like that? It might be something kind of petty, I mean, in the scheme of things, but you think about some news you had that you just, you couldn't wait to share. It might be like a restaurant, I know in our office, we talk about sometimes somebody will find a good restaurant. Have you been to this restaurant? It is so good, and you have to try it. And, and you're excited to tell that because you want people to experience what you experienced. And it was a good thing. It was fun. Another example might be a movie. You see a great movie, and you, you say, I, you have got to see this movie. It's incredible. Another one, a book. I had someone come up just before the, the service started and said, there's two books you have to read. They're incredible books. I mean, there's a bunch of us that have this common addiction, and we share our book loves. And, and it's exciting. You find a book that's so exciting, you just want to tell people about it. And it's kind of on a smaller scale, of course, kind of what it's like with Jesus, that we, we found something in him that's so good and so beautiful, we just want to share it. Maybe a better illustration would be like grandchildren. You know, I, I can tell you that just about every one of you who have grandchildren have showed me your pictures. Okay, right, and we know that's true, right? It happens. People show up. You put them on Facebook. We see if you have grandchildren, uh, 
and I don't, I have no experience of this, but I, I can guess that if you do, you just want everybody to have the fun of these little people. I mean, we all have things that we're really excited about that we want to share. We want other people to know about, and that we want them to understand uh, who this fun thing in our lives is, and we want people to experience it and have fun with it and rejoice in it and share the same kind of vision that we have. It's really fun. And they may not be grandchildren, but they're still special. They're fun and important part of our lives, and you just want people to know that and have to experience that and have fun with this in the same way that you have fun with these kind of things. You just want to share because it's so much fun. When I have grandkids, I'm going to be showing you more pictures. But until then, it's Mosley is what you get. But we're looking today at the book of Acts and that we really have something that's great to share. We have something that's so fun, so good, so joyous. It's just got to be shared. And so listen now. This is the beginning of the book of Acts. Jesus has been with them for 40 days and talking to them. It says in the first six verses, talking to them about the kingdom of God. And this is his last moment with them. Listen now to the word of God. This is chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. So when they had all gathered together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know times and dates which the Father has established under his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the farthest ends of the world. And after he had said these things, while they were looking at him, he was taken up before them, and a cloud obscured him from their eyes. And as they were standing there, staring up into the sky, look, two men stood beside them wearing white clothing. And they said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into the sky? This very Jesus, who was just taken up from you into heaven, will return from heaven in exactly the way he left. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his good word. So they're all together. This is after Jesus' resurrection. He's been teaching them about the word. And they ask this question, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? It's not sure what they mean by this, what exactly they're asking. It could be, and some books have written this, that it's kind of a negative perspective. It's the old perspective of that the idea is they hated the Romans and they were eager for some new king, a King David, to rise up and he was going to kick the Romans out and he was going to restore a, a new Israel. Even the Greek word that's used there, restore, it means to restore, bring back to a former glory it once had. And they're asking him, perhaps, there's one understanding of the passage, Jesus, are you going to be that King David? Are you going to rise up and create it into what it used to be, the glory days? Others have said that the disciples knew better than that. (coughs) Excuse me. The disciples knew better than that. They knew that everything had changed with the resurrection. And with Jesus' promise in the passage just before that I didn't read, and in here he mentioned with the coming of the Holy Spirit, They knew in their understanding that at the last days, at the end of everything, there would be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and and a new kingdom. And perhaps they're asking this. But for Jesus, it doesn't really matter. He's saying he distracts, he turns their minds off of the times and date settings. It's an important thing, and it would be a a good lesson that the church should be listening to. That it's not for us to know times and dates that the Father's established in his own authority. For some reason, parenthetically, we Christians love to set dates and try and figure out when exactly the last days are. Uh, You may or may not know, but it's supposed to be tomorrow, another prediction, Uh, April 23rd, tomorrow. So parenthetically, uh, this might be a good day to put a whole lot in the offering plate just in case, 
Just saying. I mean, it's, just, it's not as well known as Harold Camping's huge prediction about eight years ago when he spent $100 million trying to get the word out that Jesus would return at a specific time and date. And the only thing all of these people and groups have in common is they've all been wrong. And we would do well to listen to what Jesus says, that it's not for us to know times and seasons. It's for us to be busy doing what the Father has told us to do. And we're to be witnesses. And he says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You will receive power. And you will be my witnesses. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the farthest ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. Now, some people have looked at these words, these four areas, and they've seen it and interpreted it primarily in geographical terms. Jerusalem would be like the, the area right around you. Your people, your people the people of your same culture, maybe your family. This would be like your, your Judea or your Jerusalem is your family, the colleagues you work with, the immediate people right around you. Judea would well, be Ventura, the people of Ventura. Samaria, California, and people that don't live close, maybe a little different, different cities, different cultures, different views, but California and in the farthest ends of the earth, anywhere we might go, Albania, where we work, and West Africa, and Turkey. That might be one way to look at it, and I don't think it's a bad way to look at these words like that, but I think that in all honesty, that's not how the disciples would have heard this. And what Jesus is talking about is opening their eyes to people groups that they might have been afraid of and they might have, by nature, not wanted to be involved with. I think what Jesus is saying is you have a message to tell. And it doesn't matter if it's close or the farthest away. You have a message to tell. And wherever you go, that message is not going to be easily received. Sometimes it sounds like Jerusalem, that these are the people that we like, we know, and they're just going to welcome us in. But the fact of the matter is, the people in Jerusalem in their day, they were not at all open to the message. Or it was a hard word. It was a hard work. And Jesus is saying, look, not everybody's going to believe what you tell them about me. Not everybody's going to be pleased about the message but I want you to go to Jerusalem. It doesn't matter how hard it is, I want you to go to Jerusalem and you tell them about me. In Samaria, they were even stranger to the Jews. They were not liked, they hated each other. They worshiped different, they had a different view of God. And Jesus is saying, I want you to go to the Samaritans. And it's not always gonna be easy and they're not always gonna receive you, but I want you to go to Samaria. I want you to tell them about me. And, and then the ends of the earth, you're thinking about the Roman Empire. You're thinking about all kinds of different languages, all kinds of crazy different religions. And Jesus is saying, I want you to go to them too. And it's going to be hard with them as well. But I want you to go to them. I want you to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the farthest ends of this earth. And they're all going to have struggles with what you say and they're going to disbelieve, but I want you to go. Because see, God is a seeking God. That's what we saw all these, these last weeks. He pursues us, and he pursues us through us. He wants to use us, use the disciples here, and use us to go find other people as we point to Jesus. So he says, you will be my witnesses in Judea, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And that's our call. That is our call upon our lives. It is our vocation. Whatever it is that we might do in addition, whatever job or task we may spend our days doing, our vocation is to be a witness of Jesus, to point to him, to help others understand who he is and what he's done and why he matters and why he's good, to be a witness to him. But it's not easy, is it? You know, they, we, we don't have a real passion for that E word, evangelism. It's kind of a negative and scary word. It's, it's something that we like to believe that Billy Graham has the gift of evangelism and the rest of us can just leave it alone. There's a recent poll done by Barna Research last September or so, and it said that 62% of born again evangelical Christians believe that they have no responsibility to share their faith with another. 62%. That's a huge amount. And yet the fact of the matter is the scriptures make it very clear that we're to be his ambassadors. We're to be witnesses. We're to be people who point to Jesus. But it's hard. 
And you ask, well, why is it that we don't do that? Why has that come so difficult to us? And there's some really good reasons. There really are. I think sometimes we beat ourselves up over these things, and we don't realize that it is hard. And it's hard for a lot of reasons. One reason is, to be honest, just simple lack of faith. And there's not one person in this room that doesn't struggle with that. Not one. You think about the Christian message that the disciples had to tell, the Christian message that we have to tell, that there is this great God who became a human, who was crucified on the cross, dead, buried, and rose again in three days. And it's a wild message. It's a crazy message in so many ways. And we're afraid sometimes to say that. And we're, we actually have our own struggles with it. We have our own struggles with believing that God would use you to change another person's life. That the Holy Spirit would come on you and shape your life to touch another. We have a hard time believing that. But the best way to get around that is just to do it. You know, the great old hymn, the great old words, trust and obey. We want God sometimes to say, Lord, if you'll just fall on me with all the power of your Holy Spirit, let me just feel you in my heart, let it come alive and really powerfully real, and then I'll share my faith. And God says, I don't work that way. You go out and share your faith and I'll show up. You tell somebody about me and I'll show up. I'll be in your words. And we have to trust and obey. We have to go out when we feel like we're alone. We have to go out when we feel like the message is just absurd. And we go out and we trust and we believe he will show up. Another thing that makes it really hard to share our faith is is we don't feel like we know enough. I've had people say that over and over. As I'd like to share my faith, I really would. But I just don't feel like I know enough. I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't know enough about theology. And what if they ask really big questions or hard questions? I don't know what to say. And you know, that's a legitimate fear. It's perfectly understandable why, why any of us in this room would feel that way. We live in a world that's more and more skeptical of the Christian faith. It's a wild message to begin with. And it makes a lot of sense when you look at some of the complexities and sorrows and troubles that there are questions that, that are very hard to answer. In theology, there's an area of theology called theodicy, which is basically the problem of evil. It's the question of how can a God who is all-powerful and all-good allow evil to exist in the world? And you know, that question has been swirling around churches and the cultures and the academies for longer than Job. It's a thousands and thousands of year old unanswered question. And you need to know that God is not expecting you to answer it. You don't have to know or have an answer to that question. There's a lot of sorrows in this world. Why, do, why does God let little kids die? Why, why, why does leukemia happen to children? Why, are, why is there such war in Syria and terrible atrocities, gassing and chemical warfare? Why would God allow that? Why, why does he allow shootings in high school campuses? Why? There's huge questions. And you know, God is not expecting you to have an answer for those. It's not on you to come up with an answer to these incredibly complex, difficult things. We're not answers to all the huge questions. We're witnesses to what we have in Jesus. And all you really need to do, all you you should do, is, is point to what Jesus has done in your life. It's okay to say, I don't know about that. I don't know why kids have cancer. I don't know. But I know Jesus has changed my life. I don't know why kids die of something as terrible as leukemia, but I know that in my first youth group, when I had a little guy in seventh grade named Ty Willis who died of leukemia that year, I know God was in his life and in the life of his family. And I don't know how the evil of that sickness worked, but I know God was at work in him. And so we point to what we do know. We, we bear witness to what we've experienced. The, the great story. This is in John chapter 9. And there's the blind man and the Pharisees. Jesus had healed this blind man on a Sabbath, which was verboten in the eyes of the Pharisees. It should not have been done. And because of that, they're incredibly certain that Jesus cannot be from God. If he was really from God, he never would have broken the Sabbath. 
And so they debate around, and they bring the blind man up, and they say, were you really blind, or are you just faking it? They challenge him on that. And they say, who do you think he is? And the man says, he's a prophet. And they didn't like that answer and sent him out. And they brought him back in a little later, and they say, give glory to God, which is their way of saying, you're under oath. Tell the truth this time. We know that this man's a sinner. Now you tell us the truth. And this blind man says this beautiful line that should be the, the freeing words for all of us. He says, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I can see. How has Jesus touched your life? What good has he brought into your life? If you were to take a few minutes later today and just with a pad of paper or your computer or your iPad and you just typed out a little brief paragraph that Jesus has done this for me. Could you write something out? And what would you write out? You know, that's all your job, so to speak, is, is to bear witness to that. I don't know about the problems of evil in this world. I don't know why things happen the way they do, but I know Jesus touched my life in 1975. I know Jesus has touched my life since then over and over and over, and he's changed me. I know that he is good and that he is faithful. And our job, our work, is simply not to answer all the world's problems, but to point to Jesus, to point to Jesus and say he is good. The last thing, and there's so many more things that could be said, but for the sake of time, is to simply say this, that the most important task you can do for others when you share your faith is to do less sharing and more listening. You know, we, we sometimes find Christians that turn into spiritual bullies just trying to convince somebody how evil they are and they need to confess that wrong and we don't ever listen. But the person that's most likely to listen to you is the one that knows you love them. The one that's most likely to listen to you is the one that you've listened to for a long time, that you've built a relationship to. And that they will love you because they know they're loved. It's what they call earning the right to be heard. We have to earn the right to be heard. And when someone knows that you care, they're much more likely to listen to you. And finally, one other practical thing, very practical. You can let it go. I don't know why it went. Well, there's... Thanks, Greg. I think my computer caught my cold. The one last thing to say is this, is that, you know, the best way to share your faith is for it to bubble out naturally. To not fake a message and contrive a message. The thing where our faith is most powerful and most influential is when it just bubbles out of your life natural. When people see and sense and receive and feel a love from you that's unlike anything others do. When you show a kindness that comes from your own walk with God that bubbles out of your life naturally, that's what captivates people. And they'll ask, you know, why is it that you're like that? Why is it that you're that way? You know, the secret that we do is we want to love people until they ask why. The secret of evangelism is you love them until they ask why. And you've earned the right to be heard. If we unleash the church and we go out into this world loving this world with a message that is so good, not going out as spiritual bullies, but as people who just want to love and show the love of God. And we love them so much that when they ask why are you doing this, we have an answer. It's Jesus. He's changed my life. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for your loving kindness. We thank you for your grace and we pray, Lord, that you would you would walk with us, you would touch us, that you would transform us. Lord, I pray that you would use our lives to show your goodness. And we thank you, Lord God, for how faithful you are to us. Lord, give us your word. Give us your message. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit and use us this week to bring your good to this hurting and broken world. We ask this in Jesus' great name. Amen.